Hello and welcome to Happy Homes, the podcast that wants to help you feel not just safe, secure and comfortable, but joyful wherever you live. Now, personalising your home. Resi's recent Happy Homes survey found that it is vital to your long-term happiness and well-being in a space. But how do you inject some personality into your home while keeping things stylish? And just exactly what should you personalise? Well, with me today to answer those questions are interior designer Lucy Henderson of My Bespoke Room and Damisha Vicaria, who is a designer at Resi. Lucy, Damisha, thanks for coming to chat to me today. Hello. Hi, nice to be here. So, Lucy, personalising your space. At My Bespoke Room, what kinds of things do you help people personalise? Okay, so at My Bespoke Room, we design so many different spaces for so many different clients. Um, We design for a wide range of budgets and styles, but we always very much design with the occupants in mind. So, you know, it's very much a collaborative process. The space must function for the client as well as look beautiful as well. So we find that people come to us for professional guidance on how to make their house a home. Um, You know, they're worried about making expensive mistakes, you know, buying a sofa that might not fit or a rug that might look lost in a room so it's very much a collaborative process and we design all rooms from sort of kids bedrooms to the little sort of um, downstairs loo to yeah big open plan spaces as well so um, you know we, we find it really important to get the layout right for the client and for the space really make the most out of that space but um, once we've sort of agreed on a layout then we go through with the client and determine sort of a design direction so you know a colour palette and a style um, for the room as well so um, yeah we cover all aspects of the design. Right so it's much broader than just figuring out what cushions and curtains people are going to have isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. And as I say, it's always um, very bespoke to that client as well, because there's no point designing a beautiful show home if it doesn't function for them. So it's got to look beautiful, but it's got to function as well. Damisha, what about you at Resi? Well, we at Resi, we're trying to incorporate the new extensions with the original dwelling and how to get that incorporated all together in one space and having that specialised to that person and it's like largely dependent on how the individual lives and um, how they want to use this space so making sure that the spatial planning between both new and old sync very nicely together from boot rooms for dog owners to open plans for people who love to host making sure that they see their way through their entire house and it's just making sure that using the amount of space given in the new extension and making sure that space is designed correctly. Okay, that makes perfect sense. So Damisha, when people are thinking about personalising their space, they immediately do jump to things like cushions and photos. It's definitely what I thought about before I did some research for this episode. But what are some of the key spatial elements of a home that you can personalise that people might not think of? I would definitely say openings, openings to allow light and Bifold doors seem to be the in thing. Everyone wants to have the indoor-outdoor feel. That makes a large difference. Even skylights to um, Oriel windows. I think my favourite is one of the Oriel windows features, which are really nice. And those are the type of things that actually personalise a space too. Because if you're a book reader, an Oriel window is lovely to sit by the Oriel window and read a book and look out into your garden. Same with the indoor and outdoor space of a bifold door. So it's, it's spatial elements, which is what we need to be looking at. Mm, yeah, I'd love an Oriel window. I'm always looking at those in design magazines. <laughs> <laughs> Lucy, why is it important to think about these spatial elements as well as the dressing bit? Yeah, well, as I said before, I think, you know, the key to a well-designed home is getting the layout really to work for the client. And I think we we often advise, um, like Resi, on repositioning of windows and doors, maybe removing doors if we can do as well to really sort of open out a space and make it flow. So I think that that's, you know, that's kind of key. And then it's moving on to Um, choosing the right furniture for that space really Um, I think and you know the right flooring paint colours accessories everything else but I think and um, I'm sure you'll you'll agree most living spaces are becoming so much smaller now and there's just we're asking so much more of our our living spaces as well so I think as a designer you've just got to be really clever with the space and make sure that you make use of every little nook in a a home and you know really make use of every sort of millimetre so 
so I think that the space planning always comes first and then, you know, you can inject the personality um, and the colour that that kind of follows on naturally. Yeah, absolutely. We're going to come on a bit later, actually, to talk more about multi-purposes of rooms, because obviously I think that's never been more important, has it, than the way that we're living now. So, Damisha, I wanted to ask you, there's a sort of never-ending chat about how desirable it is to have an open plan living space, but is it difficult to personalise? I don't think it's too difficult to personalise. It's um, an individual who cho- chooses an open plan in their living purpose. So if someone is loving an open plan, they have a purpose for the open plan. And with that comes reasons why they've gone for the open plan and how they would then go on to, of course, decorate and interior design it. So clients can have kids who they want to keep an eye whilst they're cooking. There's all these aspects that clients actually look at when designing an open plan, from making a walkthrough feel, letting light through the entire house. The personalization is already there by you making the decision of having an open plan, I feel sometimes. And it's how they would like to make it look and the purpose of the entire plan, actually. Lucy, what do you think about that? Do you think sometimes people maybe pick an open plan without really thinking through their needs? Yeah, I mean, I suppose it depends whether they've worked with an architect to design that space or whether it's a home they've sort of, you know, moved into and and inherited that space. Um, I personally love designing open plan spaces. I think that it's it's a real challenge because you've often got to incorporate the living space, the dining space and entertaining space storage for all those kids toys and then sometimes it can end up being a a spare room for when guests stay a sofa bed so there's or an office space you know there's there's loads to to think about but I do think the key is really zoning those areas and that's where you can add the personalization so something as simple as putting a large rug in the living room area that instantly could add a pop of colour pattern or just you know um, zone that area as a relaxation you know sort of lounge area Um, things like lighting is so key as well in that open plan space you might drop a pendant over the dining table or have an overarching lamp over that dining table to sort of zone that area and bring ambient lighting in Um, and also just you know personalising by adding floor lamps um, you know to to be a feature of a corner or table lamps Um, and and then obviously there's the kind of the the cushions and the the plants and everything else as well so um, I think there really is a lot you can do but I do think the key is to zoning those areas within that open space. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. Zoning is actually really, really important. <laughs> Otherwise, the space just gets lost in, in the space that it's in. Yeah, so true. Yeah, I think I've been to some homes where it's been, been a bit like that. And I certainly wouldn't know how to zone, I don't think, in an open plan, which luckily I don't have. Especially if there's spotlights throughout mm. as well. You've got one layer of lighting, you know, layer that lighting. Otherwise, yeah. it just can feel quite a stark open place. Um, and you might just want to have the lamps on in that living area and, you know, switch the lights off in the kitchen and the dining table. You don't want to look at the washing up, you know, when you're relaxing in the evening. So I think, yeah, l- lighting and, um, yeah, so many more things you can do to zone. So, Damisha, I know that one of the things people are increasingly personalising is that under the stairs area. What are some of the things that you can do with that? It's quite endless, actually. It depends on how you want to use the space. You've got WCs underneath the staircase, utility spaces as well, um, storage. We actually had a client that wanted a desk space because of this new working from home, didn't have another space. A desk space, which was actually a really nice find that I found on Pinterest. And even floating staircases, like having a feature underneath the foot, floating staircases. So it doesn't have to always be a usable space, but a very nice design space to look at, if that makes sense. Yeah, I didn't think about that, actually. I just thought, oh, you want to put your washing machine under it or make it into an office or do something immediately with it. But yeah, you could just have it as a design area if you've got the space, if you've got luxury of the space, I suppose. Or presumably if it's too small to make into another area, then make it a design feature. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, perfect. So Lucy, during lockdown... As we were saying before, the rooms in our homes have had to really work hard for us and be multi-purpose. What are some of the most creative things you can do with a room to get multiple uses out of it? Well, as you say, at the moment, everyone's working from home, homeschooling. Um, you know, I, I feel everyone's pain as well. Um, so it is trying to yeah, get get the best out of out of your rooms. 
Not everybody is lucky enough to have a dedicated home office space. So um, quite often we're combining um, home, of- home office and guest bedrooms. So for instance, well, people aren't really having guests to stay at the moment. So it may be that you've got a sofa bed or a day bed in there that can kind of pull out when you have guests to stay. But the majority of the time it's, you know, it's kind of packed away and you've got enough floor space and, and desk space in there um, to work from home. Also, you know, it doesn't have to be a, a full size, huge desk to be able to work from. So quite often in older properties in a guest room, there might be a fireplace with an alcove and we might just add a kind of ledge in there to create a little desk space with some shelving above or a cupboard above. Um, so we do that quite often. We also incorporate desks and study areas into living spaces as well. Mm-hmm. So it may be that you could just, you know, pull up a dining chair, have a, um, have a little pull out desk that maybe is shut behind doors. So when you've clocked off from work, you can, you know, kind of push the desk away and close it away and move the chair out of the way um, and log off from work. And then I think also it's important to think vertically about the space in mm. your home as well. So people often think about it on, on plan and the floor space. But for example, in a toilet, in a bathroom, family bathroom, if you haven't got, a, you know, much storage, think about maybe the toilet with a concealed cistern behind it build out the wall to conceal the cistern and maybe a cupboard at high level Mm, so you're making use of that space above um above the toilet for your towels and your your toiletries and things like that Um, another thing we do quite often is to add fitted dining bench seats into kitchens or dining rooms that's a real space saver because you don't have to pull out chairs from both sides that dining bench seat can double up a storage you can have cupboards or drawers underneath and you can even add shelves above or cupboards above as well thinking about it sort of vertically so it's just about really making making that space work (laughs) I like the idea Lucy of the pull out tables if you haven't got an office that's a good one Damish have you got any ideas about creative use of space if you need to make your room be multi-purpose I would totally agree with the pull out desks I think those are the things that have now become a definite um, must have but also little rooms I know like the UK houses have this box room type feel that going on people actually don't know what to do with that space quite often we can either double it up as a dressing room like a walk-in wardrobe every lady would love something like that or that can actually become an office space also anything to do with the utility area I feel people don't want to be looking at their washing whilst they're having dinner with people coming coming over so having stacked up utility spaces I was just designing one for another client where we stacked up the utilities and you could not see it because it was closed behind doors but it was actually still in the kitchen so it's making sure that space that is used is used in a smart way that you are happy in the way you're living. I have never seen that before that sounds great actually. I would love that in my house. <laughs> Lucy, I think many of us have accidentally personalised bits of our homes. I mean, I certainly have. I've acquired a lot of stuff. And I think over the years, lots of mementos, pictures, bric-a-brac. And then I sort of think that I've finished, <laughs> which I know I haven't. But the opposite of that is that you sometimes feel like you're living in a show home. So if you've maybe never really settled into a place and put anything personal out, where should you start? Yeah, absolutely. I think um, people lack confidence sometimes just to know where to start. Um, There are so many simple and really inexpensive ways to add your personality to a home. I would start by adding soft furnishings um, to add colour and pattern and texture to a room. If you're not a big colour fan, you know, think about just adding texture and natural materials maybe. So it just adds a little bit of interest, but not necessarily in your face colour. What we would say is maybe choose um, a colour palette and a style for your room and then start to pull items together um, within that. So the colour palette could start from a piece of artwork that you already own. You may have a lovely seascape and you might say, oh, well, I'm going to opt for a blush and grey or a blush and blue colour palette. Um, So then you can start introducing pops of the colour through maybe a rug or some cushions or even just a throw. And once you build your confidence, you can start to sort of pull that um, that design together. I'd say, as I have before, you know, floor lamps, table lamps are a great way to add um, add personality. And also with light fittings, um, people tend to live with the light fittings that were maybe already in the house when they moved in, mm. and they might be living with a 
dated chandelier that they really wouldn't have chosen themselves. There's so much choice out there with light fittings and actually it's not a hugely expensive thing to to replace. So maybe think about replacing that. And then another thing that we're seeing more and more very much on trend right now and an amazing and inexpensive way to transform a room is plants. Um, So whether it's a large pot plant of a corner that can add texture, colour, even pattern to a room um, down to, you know, maybe just a little row of succulents on a shelf. I think plants are a really great way to introduce texture, colour and personality. If you're not green fingered or worried about killing plants, succulents are amazing. I'm not very good with plants, but they are surviving (laughs) touchwood, my little succulents. Um, Or there's amazing faux plant options as well Mm. now. So many on the high street. So if you don't want to have to think about watering them every couple of weeks, then go for faux. Yeah, I like this idea of faux plants. There was somebody I was speaking to recently who said if she finds a plastic flower in a house she just throws it out but I think they've become really sophisticated now haven't they yeah they're so much better than they used to and actually I've had to really go up and sort of really you know touch and feel (laughs) something to realize whether it is um it is fake or not I mean there are still some naff ones out there and I think sometimes you do get what you pay for but um yeah there's loads of um, interior retailers that have absolutely nailed the faux plants (laughs) wonderful and we found from our resi survey that plants were just so important to making people happy they help you with your concentration they're just so brilliant so yeah yeah. and they purify the air as well which is always good yeah (laughs) we're big on plants at the minute definitely So, Damisha, let's talk a little bit about colour. How do you decide on a palette that reflects your personality? Oh, it's a difficult one, I think. (laughs) For for someone who's design-based and you know so much about colour and things like that, I find it overwhelming myself to even try and pick some stuff that I like because I'm like, oh, it looks nice in green, but it really looks nice in blue. Um, (laughs) For me, it's something like that. But in terms of how... It can reflect your personality. I think it's what is what is drawn to you, what actually makes mm. you feel that you feel something towards it, as silly as it may sound, like feeling something towards a, a chair. But the colour of the chair, the look of it, that's what's going to make you feel comfortable and be happy in your home. You don't want to go for maybe a wooden chair, which is really hard and harsh, whereas you want to go for a nice suede green finish. like <laughs> And that could depend on how your mood is throughout the house or even the mood that you're actually trying to play in that specific room and on your personality, I feel. Mm, Yeah, because we need to think about moods, don't we, with colours, because obviously they change the feeling of an area. So if it's for work, you need a different colour to if it's for relaxing, presumably. exactly. And is there a science to that or is it, is it, again, something very personal? So if you feel you like working with a yellow wall, is that what you should go for? I always say to clients, it's worth looking at your wardrobe to see what colour you're drawn to. Ah, So, you know, if you've got a wardrobe full of colours and patterns and, um, you know, you you love to wear colours and patterns, then quite often you'll be comfortable having those colours and patterns in your home because the home is very much the extension of you. Um, You know, maybe you've got a muted wardrobe, you don't like a lot of colour and pattern, but actually you could still add interest to your home by maybe natural materials and textures, so maybe linens and walls and uh, certain natural stones like marble and timber. So you've kind of got that natural uh, texture and pattern, but in a muted colour tone and in quite a um, yeah sort of na- natural way added to your home. But yeah, I try to make sure that um, clients don't follow trends just because blue and mustard is the current trend doesn't mean you have to have it in your home you know it's 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 all about what what excites you and what you feel comfortable um living in because we've had so many clients say oh I've gone for something because it was on trend and actually I didn't like geometric prints um and I would never push somebody into going for something that wasn't something they're they're happy with really so it's so difficult because it can evoke so many different um, moods and you know myself in my home I love colour I love pattern which I use quite a lot in my home but there's certain spaces that actually I want to be like a sanctuary cool Mm. calm 
you know, neutral. So for instance, my bathroom, my bedroom, there's very little colour in those rooms because that's where I want to relax. And um, yeah, but whereas in my workspace, I quite like a bit of colour and pattern because it's, you know, yeah, it's it stimulating. inspires me. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Yeah. Um, so it's so different for everybody. <laughs> okay, okay, good to know. I, but I really like the tip of looking at your wardrobe because I've ne- I would never have thought to recommend that to someone. So that's perfect. Um, Lucy, I wanted to ask you as well, We've all been to one of those homes that's crowded with clutter from travels or accumulated bits and bobs. My home has been one of those homes, I've got to confess. <laughs> I'm trying to simplify things. I'm the same. I'm exactly the same. <laughs> I've tried, been trying to strip stuff out as I keep moving. But what's a good way, if you're one of those people that does like displaying mementos and keeping bits and bobs, what's one of the best ways to display it without creating a sort of dust trap? Yeah, I um and this is something I do personally and I, I recommend to people. Um it's quite nice if you've collected artwork pieces from your travels. There might be, I don't know, little kind of vintage postcards or maybe something that a street artist has done, you know, things that you've collected um on your travels. It's quite nice to take those, even though they all might be very different styles and colours, and maybe get them framed all in uniform frames. So maybe all in black frames, all in white frames. And then you can start to create a little bit of a gallery wall, just dedicate one space. You know, it might be in your hallway or it might be going up your stairs and then maybe start from one or two favourite images and and work sort of vertically or horizontally and and start to work your way out. And then that's something you can add to. So it's kind of got some kind of order, but it's also displaying things from different, you know, different places. Another thing I think is, to just maybe dedicate one or two areas for those um, those items so it might be a little set of shelves um, and you know curate them find a few of those items pull them together on the shelf put the rest away in a box this is something I do a lot <laughs> yeah. put it away where it's accessible and maybe in four six months time have a little move around take that box out oh gosh I remember this and and reorder your shelf and then you've got a whole new little shelfie and you know it can constantly evolve I don't think you need everything out all the time really no definitely not and uh, that's what I've been trying to stop myself from doing as I get older and travel further yeah it's very tricky (laughs) yeah Damisha I think you told me maybe I've got this wrong but did I hear you say to me that you into crystals yes so how do you display your crystals or where do you have them? Do you have a special place for them? So I actually have them in my bedroom. I have, guilty, but I have some next to my um, bedside table because they're for cleansing your sleep and making sure you sleep well. And then I have where I'm working at the moment, which is normally my dressing table for like clean energy and things. So I think in terms of like maybe the purpose of the object can be moved around but I don't. I haven't collected enough for there to be a clutter just yet. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's very tricky that fine line between a curated selection or display and just things plonked on a shelf and <laughs> you know, kind of creating dust. And um, yeah, it, it's a tricky one. <laughs> But I do love going to people's homes where there is a story behind Mm. items in the room. And we very much encourage, um, you know, if they've got existing piece of artwork or an existing vase or, you know, table or whatever that's got a story behind it. It may be inherited or it may have been collected from their travels to to keep that and you know we incorporate that design it into the room because I just think it's so important for there to be kind of stories about people's lives within their home as well. Yeah I think that's a really really good point I definitely try and do that with mine um, and certainly with the travel objects but there's also a massive drinks cabinet and all the bottles have probably got a story as well so (laughs) it depends what you ask me about. (laughs) Amazing. I I say that because my partner's a bar owner so we're allowed to have loads of alcohol in the house. Oh Oh, I haven't I haven't got that excuse (laughs) (laughs) let's just talk quickly about photos because lots of people like to have photos of themselves and their family members but what are some of the you know if you don't just want photo frames stood on a shelf or a bookcase what are some of the more creative ways that you can use photos Damisha do you want to answer that I would say using photos, it's how you use that individual photo, whether it's like an abstract piece or it's a family photo. It's, mm. it's, there's a difference between you can't be having like maybe a, your grandparents next to a huge abstract piece. There's, there's a level of making it more organized, but having those specific rooms for that, I feel sometimes as well. Like 
I would love to have a lovely abstract piece in the dining area rather than maybe a family picture, for example. Also, the idea of putting them in different or like consistent frames is really nice. The, the collection of all the frames that you have. Um, I really currently liking the trend of the double glass frames where there's mm. the most thinnest fr- a frame, like the golden rustic thin frame and it's double glass. Another thing that is, is like people are putting like flowers and stuff with alongside those pictures and then putting it and pressing it against those. So it's just those little, little things that start bringing it like a little bit homely, something special to you, I think. Hmm. Yeah, I like the double glass frames too. Lucy, have you got any tips for alternative photo displays? Yeah, I think now, you know, it doesn't have to be the big canvas family picture above the fireplace. You know, we've kind of moved on from that. Not everybody, you know, there's still a place for that. But, um, you know, we, we have kind of moved on from that a little bit. And I think picture ledges um, are really great, um, as you can see behind me, a great way of um, displaying photographs in quite a flexible way. So you can have, you know, your family photos. As the kids grow up, you can switch them around, put other, you know, new maybe big group friend photos that you might have a recent one that you want to put on um, on the ledge and you don't have to then keep putting holes in your wall Mm. it's it's easy to to kind of um yeah evolve really and keep moving moving things around I think another way as Demisha said was doing a you know curated gallery wall as well so depending on your style you could go all the same frames in a very simple grid maybe all black and white so it you know it looks quite uniform and and quite minimalistic um or you could go eclectic with all different types of frames you know stars and shapes and and then keep adding to it um i think there's so many ways of creating a gallery wall you know you might want it running up your staircase you might want it you know in a family dining area um the possibilities are endless really and i think another way that i i quite like doing it is you know especially with instagram we've got the square Instagram images is there's loads of these large frames with sort of multiple apertures and so you can you know you could print gosh so many photos off and frame them all in just one frame and it looks really really great as well so yeah yeah you can just be creative (laughs) I I did exactly that actually I had a frame made to measure and then I printed off a load of pictures and put them in but when I got the pictures back I realized that I actually hadn't made sure they were all square so <laughs> so it was a present for my fiance and I made such a boo-boo with it I've learned my lesson and I love the frame and now it's kind of all done and I reordered the pictures and you know it worked, it worked oh. out in the end but when it came to the actual I think it was his birthday um when oh it was our anniversary I think when I it came to the anniversary I had to do something like clip it in one of those hanging frames that like, just have like wooden oh. little wooden tassels to say this is your fake present the real one's oh. coming so I, it's a it was an absolute <laughs> fail but it looks gorgeous now so yeah <laughs> yeah because it used to obviously they used to be always squared in yes, the um, exactly. Instagram, but it, you can change it now so that's messing with it <laughs> yeah. so you get the idea massive tip from me definitely check the measurements of the pictures first before you order always plan out um, a gallery yes. wall before you put start hitting a nail into the wall cut out bits of paper or lay them out on the floor figure out the the arrangement before you you know pick up your hammer yeah, that's <laughs> exactly what I had to do when I was moving to university trying to make that uni accommodation homely was the most exciting but difficult thing because you're like putting up pictures and you're laying them out on the floor and you're like trying to make that your new home and I totally agree with the the photos in that instance mm, yeah. yeah they're very <laughs> important for settling you so let's just talk a bit about bedrooms if I was thinking about this Damisha if you've got a guest bedroom and you want to personalize it but it's going to be used by more than one person and maybe different kinds of guests what kinds of things should you do you know without it making it feel like it's an extension entirely of your own bedroom for example um I would definitely say comfort is the key anyone that comes into your house you want them to feel comfortable in the space that they're in um also you don't want them to feel overwhelmed by your likings you want them to feel that comfort so it's like it's kind of making that room into a hotel feel like hotel rooms are kind of a majority liked by most people and I think that's the type of idea to go for in terms of when you're designing a guest room It's making it feel like they've just walked into a neutral but cozy and keeping it very comfortable for them because some people may not find it that comfortable to be 
moving from um, someone else's house to their from their own. Mm, yeah, we did a, an episode of the podcast recently, and one of my guests said, "If you're going to stay at someone's house, you could always take a pillow with you if you're not sure about the pillows." But I do think I think you can only probably do that with your family because if it's your mates, I'd be really offended if someone came with their own pillow. <laughs> Put their own pillow. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but it is a good point. If you don't have a good pillow, you don't sleep well, do you? So, yeah, yeah. Com- I got, I comfort is the key good. factor. I feel comfort is the yeah. key. Comfort is the key. I completely agree with all of that. I think. Yeah, yeah. I think kind of thinking about hotel rooms is a really good tip yeah Yeah, I like that a lot Lucy what about if you've got kids because obviously kids themselves often want to personalize their own rooms but it might not be quite in keeping with the style that you want for the whole house so how do you get the balance there yeah I've um, suffered this many a time with two (laughs) young girls who kind of change their favorite color and their um, yeah what they love on a weekly basis I think with kids rooms it's key that the main pieces of furniture are generally neutral white preferably or timber or or maybe light gray and then you can add things through artwork cushions maybe storage boxes things like that so start to add the color and the dare I say it, theme of the room. What I tend to do is give them an area, like maybe a little shelf or a little nook that they can, they've got somewhere where they can display their little Lego creations, put their um, latest trophy up there or their junk model. So they've got that little space, but it's contained. It's not everywhere. I think picture ledges, again, are another great thing. So, you know, maybe they they love unicorns one week, but then, you know, the next week they're into, (laughs) I don't know, robots, whatever it may be. Um, at least you can quite easily change the image. You know, there's so many printables now on places like Etsy that you can get kids' artwork really inexpensively, print it at home, put it in a frame. You know, it can evolve. And I think children's rooms need to evolve with them as they grow because their taste change and their needs change as well. Um, another tip is don't give them the full colour chart when they're picking the <laughs> colour for their room. Don't go, here you go, pick your colour. Maybe cut out a selection that you could tolerate and go, right, choose which of these six colours you want for your bedroom because otherwise they're going to go for the fuchsia pink or they're going to go for the you know bright pea green. Um, so, yeah, that's a really good tip. Um, limited choice for them. They've still got a choice, but it's, you know, it's kind of limited a little yeah, bit. Curated um, choice, curated. Cur- yeah that's it and the other thing is um, wall decals which are amazing now these wall stickers there's so many around and yeah if your daughter's into fairies and they might want a little kind of fairy above their bed you know you can put that on the wall in two years time they're over fairies you can easily peel it off and replace it with something else or yeah you can add little kind of polka dots to walls Mm. there's so much fun that can be had in a kid's room and also you know you don't have to go for the um uh, the, the My Little Pony or the Hulk bedding. Go for maybe plain bedding, but add the the cushion in in whatever they whatever they want. Yeah. So it's not so in your And that face. sounds a bit more affordable, maybe as well. If, you know, you're keeping something plain for a few years. Yeah, that's it. You're not having to rebuy it every, every time they kind of change their tastes. It's just maybe print off a different picture to put in a frame, or yeah, or they can add whatever they've got their new toy on their on their special shelf. So it's evolving. <laughs> what do we think about? children's pictures on the fridge because I know lots of parents who are very divided about this in the home do you have a view about that Lucy um you know what I've actually got a space on the side of the fridge because right. we haven't got as is like an integrated fridge there's no no magnet that can attach to it which is a bit of a bonus um but I've got some of the um decorative tape so yeah if you take some washi tape which isn't going to mark the walls or anything and then you can maybe tape little frames around their artwork and kind of put it yeah put it I put it on the side of the fridge so you can see it from the one side but it's not it's not ruining the whole kitchen that's a good tip Damisha have you got any tips for children's bedrooms um I have a lot of cousins and I can definitely talk on their behalf I've got them want a car shaped bed and then you know that you don't really want to go that far but you're gonna have to at one point um definitely and like they have these stickers that you can stick I love the fact that these peelable stickers um I won't lie I had that in my own room I had Winnie the Pooh right here (laughs) (laughs) and like those little things that are removable 
I think are the best because that's what makes it affordable for the parents as well as mm. the constant change of a child who has goes from different likings to dislikes quite quickly. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> absolutely. So finally then, we've covered so much ground, ladies. If someone isn't feeling very confident about personalising their home, even if they've listened to all this brilliant advice, what should they do first, Lucy? I think, like I was saying before, really think about their likes and dislikes. Don't just follow trends because, you know, then they worry even more about them going out of fashion. You know, people do often think they don't know what they want to do with the room or they don't have their own style. But most people do. It just kind of takes a little bit of digging sometimes to get to what that that is, um, you know, what that style is. So I think kind of start small, maybe start with a smaller room in your house, you know, start with the downstairs loo, have a little bit of fun in there, you know, with maybe paint, a certain style of mirror, lighting, and then kind of work your way around or start with inexpensive things like cushions. You can get so many cushion covers now, you might already have the filler, you know, you can pick up cushion covers for, you know, Know, under ten pound now, um, and and try that with things that aren't permanent. Yeah, but again, that's what we're here for as designers. You know, to give people the confidence to make the right decisions for their home and not to make expensive mistakes. And at the end of the day, they've got to be comfortable living in that space. So it, it's you know, it's got to be right for them, and that's what we strive to do. Mm. Damisha, what do you think about that? I couldn't agree more. I think people have a idea that they have to follow the trend and for people to come into their house and like what they see. Um, I don't think it's a home if if people come in and then they like what they see and you yourself are not comfortable about it. It's the whole idea of fear of being judged if you don't have this type of interior space and it's not with the times and things like that. Definitely design to what you are pleased with, not what everyone else is being pleased because it's your happy home, not not theirs. Um, yes, you can make, for example, the guest room comfortable for them and things like that. But at the end of the day, personalising your home by little little things, as well as making sure that you're comfortable with it is the main thing. Yeah, and you're living in it at the end of the day, right? So it has exactly. to be right for you. Yeah. Okay, well, that's a brilliant note to end on. Ladies, Lucy and Damisha, thank you so much for joining me today. Thank you. Oh, yeah, thank you for having us. It's been lovely. So if you want to personalise your space but don't know where to start, remember, personalising the layout of your home from the position of windows and doors to reading nooks is all about getting it to work specifically for you and your lifestyle. If you've got an open plan layout, make sure you zone areas within it to break it up. If you're not sure what colours you like, take a look at your wardrobe for inspiration. If you're personalising a guest bedroom, focus on comfort above anything else. And finally, you don't have to display all your mementos at once. Instead, pick a few pieces and put the rest in a box. Still not taking the Resi Happy Homes test? Get yourself over to resi.co.uk happy underscore homes and find out today if you're living as well as you can. Bye for now.